Human beings have sought to write down their ideas since at least the 4th millennium BC. Throughout the centuries, over 3,000 forms of writing have developed, and many different writing materials have been tried and abandoned. From clay to papyrus, from parchment to paper, better writing mediums were always waiting to be discovered. From the 3rd millennium BC until well into the Christian era, papyrus was the most popular writing material. Papyrus is a paper-like substance made from stalks of the papyrus plant, which still grows abundantly on the banks of the Nile River. Easier to use than clay, it had the advantage of being inexpensive, lightweight, and flexible enough to be made into scrolls. However, papyrus was not well suited for making books because it was not strong enough to be gathered and sewn together and did not hold up to repeated use. An ancient writing medium that had long been used alongside of papyrus helped solve this problem. It is known as parchment. For centuries, the skins of animals have been used in a multitude of ways. As leather for clothing, sandals, and containers, as rawhide for rope and lacing, and as meticulously prepared parchment. Parchment is the collective name for all animal skin that is prepared for writing. The earliest examples of parchment date to ancient Egypt, where it was used for making scrolls. To this day, parchment scrolls continue to be used to reproduce the Torah, Judaism's five books of Moses. By the fourth century AD, Parchment had largely replaced papyrus as the most popular writing support material for books. It is most widely known from the Middle Ages, when it was bound together to make books of the Bible, the Quran, and other books from which religious services were and still are conducted. From the early Christian period, almost all book production was centered in monasteries. Here, in a large writing room known as a scriptorium, Workers copied books, all by hand. Parchment makers, also called parchmenters, together with scribes, correctors, illuminators and binders, all worked under a supervisor. But outside of monasteries, independent parchment makers and scribes produced whole books by themselves. These methods of copying on parchment were popular in Europe until the late 15th century, when the advent of paper and Johannes Gutenberg's printing press changed the world of writing for all time to come. Today, there are still a few people making parchment for a living. Marigeta Burhana Abadi is a 66-year-old clergyman in Aksum, Ethiopia, the ancient Christian capital of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Marigeta Burhana is also a modern-day parchment maker and scribe. The term Marigeta is the title given to an official of the cathedral precinct. Burhana's work involves the entire process of creating a book, from making the parchment and copying the text to binding the pages. In this video, Marigeta Burhana demonstrates these same processes that have been handed down over centuries from generation to generation. <laughs> The secret of making high-quality parchment is hard work and precision at every stage of production. Although the skins of a variety of animals can be prepared to receive writing, genuine parchment is the skin of sheep or goats. Skin from young animals, such as calves, kids, or lambs, is called vellum and is much more rare. However, in normal practice, the terms parchment and vellum are often used interchangeably. The parchment being made by Burhana in this video is made from goat skin. To prepare a skin, Burhana initially soaks it in water in a large clay jug. Later, a stone is used to remove leftover debris from the skinning process and the skin is washed again. In medieval Europe, the skins were washed in water then soaked in a solution of lime and water for up to 10 days. After this initial cleaning, the skin is stretched on a wooden frame to dry. 
At this stage, the skin is called a pelt. With strips of hide or heavy cord, the pelt is attached to the frame at intervals along its edges. In this way, it can be stretched and kept under tension. The pelt can be dried at a moderate temperature, either in the sun or in a drying room. The truly hard physical work begins with removing the hair from the stretched skin. Initially, this is done by scraping the surface of the hair side of the skin with a sharp blade called a maramami. Burhana draws the blade over long lengths of the skin. The hair quickly falls away, leaving the bare skin underneath. This side of the pelt is generally darker than the flesh side, and although both sides will be used for writing, the traces of hair follicles can often be seen in the finished product. To thoroughly clean the skin of all hair and any residue, Burhana sprinkles the skin with water and chobranna, a chalk-like substance. It is through this stage of the process that the pelt is actually turned into parchment. Using a very lightweight piece of volcanic glass called a madmas or pumice stone, Burhana now scours the skin to remove thin upper layers. Using a combination of scouring and rinsing with water as needed, Burhana works until the desired thinness of the skin is achieved. While scouring the skin, the parchmenter must stop periodically to tighten it. The skin needs to remain flexible, like a trampoline, yet tight enough for the pumice stone to do its work. At times, he must use a sharp blade to smooth a particularly rough area. The edges where the skin is held to the wooden frame require particularly close attention to ensure that the maximum portion of the skin will be usable as parchment. When the hair has been completely removed and the skin washed, scoured and wiped clean, the resulting opaque parchment is again left to dry overnight. While removing the hair, gashes in the skin are occasionally made accidentally. As the skin dries and is stretched taut, these cuts appear as circular or oval-shaped holes. Indeed, sometimes one sees holes in finished manuscripts, around which a scribe has carefully written. However, if the parchmenter notices the hole in time, he will repair it. Using needle and thread, Burhana carefully pulls the hole shut. With the fully dried opaque parchment, now as tight as a drum head, it is laid down so that Marigeta Burhana can measure the writing sheets that he will cut from the skin. The writing sheet that Burhana is laying out is called a bifolium. Using this finished bifolium as a template, Burhana first determines how many sheets can be made from his parchment skin. Seeing that he can only make two sheets from this small skin, Burhana places his template on the parchment and marks the four corners by punching holes in the skin. Then, using a metal straight edge and the same metal punch, he scores the parchment. With both sheets marked on the parchment skin, Burhana proceeds to cut the skin from the wooden frame. Moving indoors to his living room, 
He uses scissors to cut each of the outlined befolia from the larger skin. In Ethiopia, the narrow pieces of parchment that remain may later be sewn together to make scrolls that religious specialists prepare for use in spiritual healing. Once cut out and trimmed, he folds the sheets. Using the flat, blunt edge of the scissors, he carefully flattens the fold. Each bifolium makes four pages, but the pages are still not ready to write upon. Before Burhana can write, he must format the layout of the page. He determines whether he requires one, two, or three columns for writing. This is not a matter of choice or aesthetic judgment, but is predetermined by the arrangement of the book he is copying, as his copy must look the same as the original. To be sure that he writes on the parchment in straight lines, he must rule each page. Using a metal straight edge, Burhana first inscribes vertical lines to mark off three columns. Next, he turns the sheets and scores the horizontal lines on which he will write. In many old manuscripts, evidence of another line spacing process is clearly visible. Oftentimes, horizontal line spacing was indicated by pricking or punching small evenly spaced holes along both edges of the parchment sheets. The scribe would then mark a horizontal line between each set of holes. When the inscribed lines and burnishing are complete, several pairs of bifolia will be gathered one inside another and sewn together to form a section of a book called a choir. Several choirs are later bound together to make up the book and are easily seen in any finished parchment manuscript. A scribe does not simply write, he copies, and so he must have an existing text to reproduce called an exemplar. With the exemplar next to him, he is ready to write. Writing is tiring work and is therefore done in short blocks of time. In Aksum, the exemplars that Brahane and other scribes use are from the library or the treasury of the cathedral. Images of a European medieval monk painstakingly copying a manuscript with a quill pen are familiar. Instead of a quill pen, Ethiopian scribes carry on their tradition of using a shambako, a bamboo pen sharpened to a fine tip. Burhana dips his shambako into a cow horn inkwell called a kern. His hand glides across the page, forming character after character. If he makes a mistake, the quick scraping of a knife or razor blade removes the ink and the correction is made. The Ethiopians use an indigenous alphabet with 202 characters. One character for each distinct sound made in Ge'ez, the ecclesiastical language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Since each character represents a syllable, this collection of symbols is called a syllabary. Thus, each word is spelled exactly as it sounds. Writing down one column and then resuming on the top of the next, Burhana stops only to dip his pen in the ink, just as Hebrew, Christian, and Islamic scribes did for centuries before him. Today, Ethiopian scribes make black ink from a combination of ash, gum Arabic, water, and barley or sorghum roasted until it is black. Books of the Bible in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church are written in both black and red ink. 
The basic text is in black, but words for God, Jesus Christ, and the names of saints are always written in red, as are the first two lines of each chapter and the first word of each verse. Once a book is complete, Burhana will often use the very last page to record information relating to the circumstances of its production. This notation, called the colophon, may include his name and the date he concluded the work. And because these parchment books are frequently given as gifts to the church, the name of the donor who has paid for the work is also written on this last page. Not all manuscripts have a colophon, but when they do, they provide valuable information sometimes including the length of time it took to produce the book. When all the pages of the exemplar have been copied, the book is completed by binding the quires of pages between two wooden covers. After the pages are secured to the boards, they and the spine are frequently covered with damp leather. When dry, the leather adheres firmly to the wood and can be decorated or tooled. This video has demonstrated an ancient art still being practiced today, parchment making. This task of transforming an animal skin into a suitable form for writing is indeed an art that requires much time, patience, and care. It has played a valuable role in the process of copying and preserving ancient writings. Parchment making can be viewed as one of the most important developments in the transmission of sacred texts which sustain people's faith. Thank you.